Park Scholars Program at Ithaca College and North Carolina State University is perhaps the most extraordinary scholarship program in the country. The Park Scholar Program is a scholarship program that recognizes academic excellence, leadership, and community service. And what makes it unique is that it looks at all the areas equally in the selection of its scholars. The Park Scholarships take students and ask them to think about what's most important to them. It's an experience that lasts for a lifetime. That is very formative in terms of their leadership skills and experiences and helps them really think about giving back to the community. The Park Scholars Program is the legacy of Roy H. Park, a man who believed deeply in the power of education. It is a living and dynamic expression of Roy Park's core belief that with knowledge comes understanding, and with understanding comes the potential to make a difference in the world. My father thoroughly believed that success was 98% perspiration and only 2% inspiration. Although my father was never given a penny, and if he had been given a penny, he wouldn't have probably accepted it anyway, his legacy is to give back. We have a picture now of him in our office, which the students are always, especially the new ones, interested to come by and, and look at. And we talk about different stories about Roy Park. They often wonder what kind of businessman was he, what did he care about, where he was from. There is a true desire on their part to try to figure out what their place is in relation to someone as dynamic as he was. Born in 1910, Roy Park grew up on his family's farm in the small town of Dobson, North Carolina. Even as a kid, he dreamed big and worked hard. By age 12, Park landed his first job, working as a cub reporter for two weekly newspapers. Rheumatic fever sidelined Park's budding career, but did not slow him down. His mother homeschooled her youngest son while he recuperated. She did such a fine job that Roy skipped a grade when he went back to school the following year. He came from a family where they were determined to educate their children. His father always was saying, get your education, as he grew up on the farm. At the age of 15, Park graduated from high school and headed to North Carolina State, 150 miles down the road in Raleigh, the state's capital. Roy Park apparently was looking at Duke University, but his brother had a roadster, and Mr. Park had a fondness for cars, and he could bring a car to NC State. He ended up coming to NC State so he could drive his brother's car, and he found a niche here. But in his junior year, Park crashed the car, and as he told his brother, cracked it up pretty good. To pay his brother back, he took a job as an office boy at the Associated Press in Raleigh. Mostly he took uh, information over the wire, including he took the information about the stock market crash of October 1929. And then he reported on some local stories that would happen perhaps at NC State in terms of the campus. And he worked probably at least 10 or 20 hours a week on top of his academic studies. It speaks to his industrious nature and how hardworking he was. Roy saw every job as an opportunity, and it didn't take him long to work his way up to reporter. He was soon covering the governor's office. My father was a really great writer, and I think he felt that, you know, journalism was truth-telling and he always wanted to own his own newspaper. Even when he was in college, that was his, that was his dream. In 1930, when it was time to graduate, Park decided to stick around. He took a few graduate courses and signed on as the editor of The Technician, the college's newspaper. The job paid him $37.50 a month a handsome sum during the Depression. The Depression.
Depression affected everyone who lived through that era. It instilled a sense of fear that people would die destitute, and I think it was a great motivating factor for him. He learned about responsibility, and he learned about being self-sufficient, and that carried him all the way through. Named by his classmates as best writer, Park graduated in 1931 with a degree in business administration and a minor in journalism. My father felt that education was fundamental to everything in life. It's a means to achieving a sense of equality and success. He found his way through entrepreneurship and the business world. Park's career would take a series of unexpected leaps and turns, but he never strayed from his belief in the power of opportunity. While he was a senior at NC State, he saw an advertisement for someone to work in publicity, but it wasn't clear who was doing the hiring. So his challenge was to meet the hiring individual. And rather than just send his materials in and wait to hear back, Mr. Park submitted his materials in a bright pink envelope and went to where the post office box was. And the next day, he went and positioned himself near post office box 733, which was the address listed in the advertisement. And he stayed in that post office for almost the end of the morning for the man to come and go to that box and get his letters out. And when he did, <laughs> he went up and said, open that one. Some say that he followed the courier and learned that the hiring person was from the Cotton Growers Exchange. Some say that he persuaded the courier to tell him what company it was. But in any case, by the end of the day, Mr. Blaylock, who was the head of the Cotton Growers Exchange, had already received several calls all endorsing Mr. Park for this position. At his interview, Park tried to convince Blaylock that he was the man for the job, even offering to work for free for three months. Whatever he said did the trick. Blaylock hired him on the spot at $100 a month. We often tell that story to the students, and it's one of their favorite stories um, about Mr. Park, because they do appreciate the fact that he was someone who had a goal and who worked towards achieving that. For his new job, Park set out to improve the public image of cotton. His entrepreneurial savvy led him to start what he called cotton balls, wildly popular society dances that drew some of North Carolina's most beautiful bells, including Dorothy Goodwin Dent of Raleigh. He had a great big orchestra, famous from New York, always. And everybody in Raleigh wanted to go to the Cotton Ball. At first, I didn't like him. Met him at a dance. And I didn't like his looks at all. He just kept being persistent, bringing me candy, bringing me little gifts and all that stuff, and taking me to the dances. Well, he grew. He grew on me. <laughs> Soon, Roy and Dorothy married. In 1942, Park moved his family to Ithaca, New York, where he took over the failing advertising agency of the Grange League Federation, an agricultural cooperative. He turned the agency around in less than five years. My father was always looking for challenges, and he saw every obstacle as a challenge. If you want to be an entrepreneur, you have to be a leader, and you have to look at new frontiers that haven't been explored before. And um, you can't just do what the crowd is doing. And that's the way he lived his life. Then Park developed the idea of a new food brand. His first choice as a partner was Duncan Hines, the country's best known restaurant reviewer. At that time, in 1949, 
Hines enjoyed greater name recognition than the Vice President of the United States. But Hines had refused all previous requests to endorse a product. The challenge was going to be how to persuade Duncan Hines to lend his name to food. And Mr. Park persuaded him that this would help liberate a lot of housewives um, by having a brand they could trust that was reliable and they trusted only Duncan Hines' name, only his name would do. Within weeks, the Duncan Hines brand took over 48% of the national packaged food market. Seven years later, the company merged with Procter & Gamble. By age 49, Roy Park was a multimillionaire and ready to take on a new challenge. He just liked to work, always going, always thinking of something new to do. He worked hard, and he loved every moment of it. And he didn't see it as work. He always had this motto of, if it wasn't fun, why do it? And work, if you, if you don't enjoy what you're doing, then you're doing the wrong thing and you need to figure out something else to do. In 1962, at the age of 52, Roy Park bought his first television station. Within a decade, Park had become the first broadcaster to own the legal limit of seven television stations, seven AM radio stations, and seven FM stations. Eventually, he would control 22 radio stations and 11 television stations. Park also returned to his boyhood love of journalism and added newspapers to his broadcast holdings. By the time of his death, he would own 144 publications, 41 of them daily papers in 24 states. He bought up small town newspapers who often had a radio station or TV station attached. So it was a very, on the face of it, a very small endeavor. But by the time he had built that company, he reached a fourth of the people in the United States. In spite of acquiring these different outlets and having this place of significance, he also was very committed to employing local staff and local journalists and focusing on local stories. He never lost sight of the importance of local independent media and the folks who produce it. When he passed away and we were trying to figure out how to sell the company and we were looking at statements of the employees and how long they'd been there and it really struck me that many, the majority of the employees had been there multiple decades consistently, which really is a symbol to me of what type of person he was to work for. He had a very down-to-earth nature about him that I, I really respected uh, and still do. Roy Park devoted himself not just to his business, but also to the community. He served on many boards for nonprofit organizations and civic institutions. His love of education led him to serve as a long-standing trustee at North Carolina State, his alma mater, and at Ithaca College in his adopted hometown. Mr. Park was someone who stood for hard work, but always at the same time being aware that one is part of a larger community and they need to give back to that community. And that's what we look for in the Park Scholars. The service component in the scholarship program is extremely important. The students are expected to become involved in service work while they're in school, and it is hoped that someday they will ultimately give back like my dad did. When the students think about where he came from and the kind of life that he built for himself and contributions that he made, are very inspiring to them um, because they think, well, I might be able to do that also. He could have fallen flat on his face, but he had the courage to take the risks. He was more interested in 
the challenge, the creativity, than just amassing money. I think that my grandfather is a wonderful role model for the current and future student park scholars. He typified charting his own course, finding ways to take advantage of opportunities that are out there, and really making the most of them. Just his determination and commitment, I really um, think were remarkable. Uh, it's a good thing to strive for. Roy Park's commitment to helping others during his life is now realized through the philanthropy of the Park Foundation. The Park Foundation is dedicated to higher education, first and foremost, that's our biggest area of funding, quality media and independent journalism, and then environmental issues. And as much as possible, we really try and connect the three program areas together. But I think the overall goal is to protect the future by educating this next generation of students. The legacy of Roy H. Park is grounded in the vision of what can happen when you combine an extraordinary work ethic, intellectual integrity, and a profound commitment to social justice. These scholarship opportunities that we're providing in the education is really the embodiment of him. It's a way for students to, to kind of figure out who they are and what they want to be. It's a way that all of his hard work, all of his accomplishments, that his life lives on through other people. And I just wish he was here to see the wonderful things, the lives he's touched, the things that he's accomplished. <laughs>